we are getting ready to go live here in just one second. And we are live. It's Dr. J here in the house. Evan, how are we doing, man? Did you have a good weekend? I am doing wonderful. We finally got some rain. We've been in a drought for like a month. The trees, instead of turning like yellow and orange, they're just going from green to dead. So we finally got like tons of rain last night. I've wow. got some fresh water in my pond. So everything is good. That's great, man. Excellent. I know we chatted pre-show that we were going to talk about food reactions uh, and or die off reactions affecting the skin. I think this is really important. We see a lot of patients that may have skin issues, whether it's from food, uh, whether it's from gut bacterial imbalances, and whether it's from addressing or knocking down gut bacterial imbalances. So usually everything interplays. I have an interesting study I printed off over the weekend, and it's all about the food and food inflammation affecting the gut microbiome. And we know that food has a major impact on the microbiome. We know the microbiome has a major effect on the skin because the more we put stress in our gut, our body will use our major means of detoxification to deal with that stress and inflammation, whether it's to the kidneys and out the urine, whether it's out the gut, whether it's from the guts, from the liver, gallbladder, into the stool and out the gut that way or through the liver. So we have three major pathways. And then of course, the fourth one is gonna be skin skin's going to be the fourth one with exception of breath you know breath breathing you'll have some there but the skin will be the next one and the more our other means of detoxification are stressed the skin is going to be leaned upon more so the first thing is to work on other systems of detoxification less th lessen the stress load of things going in so we have input and output skin is primarily used on the output side of the equation so the first thing we can do is do things to support the output but number one root cause is decrease all the things coming in on the input. And we'll kind of break what that equation looks like input, output, down. Yeah. So in, in other words, the skin should not get involved with detox, but it can pinch hit, if you will, if it has to, if the other systems are so compromised. And then Correct. if you see a skin issue, you know that you got some work to do. Exactly. So I would say the first thing is inflammatory foods are going to have the biggest effect on the skin. And some of it's not even detoxification. Some of it just can be autoimmune and just through general inflammation and the skin cells can be affected. So we can have reactions, dermatitis, various dermatitis, which just means skin inflammation. It's hilarious. People go to the dermatologist and they're like, oh, you have a dermatitis. It's like, well, I know that. That just means my skin's inflamed. Of course, it's red. It's puffy. I know it's inflamed. I don't need you to just give me the Latin version of that same description, right? It's crazy. So yeah, so you have various dermatitis or folliculitis, which is the follicle is inflamed, right? Uh, and then the next thing would be various autoimmune things, which could be rosacea, which now is an autoimmune component, eczema, autoimmune component, psoriasis, autoimmune component. And then you have different rashes that could be fungal or bacterial. Impetigo or ringworm could be bacterial and various tinea versicolor, or in the scalp, you may see subarachnoid dermatitis or cradle cap or dandruff. These all have potential fungal bacterial implications and the psoriasis and eczema and rosacea. I had significant rosacea as a child and in, in school. I mean, I have no rosacea now, but that was strongly tied to gluten for me. So food can have reactions from an autoimmune standpoint and then just from driving inflammation and then the next thing food's going to do is, like the scientific article that I talked about earlier, it has a major impact on the gut microbiome, and that has a major impact on gut permeability. And the more permeable the gut is, the greater chance of more autoimmunity, but the greater chance that food will have more inflammation on the body because now that undigested food particles are actually getting into the bloodstream and creating more inflammation. Well, let's not forget- I just want to hi highlight one thing. When you actually swallow food and it's in your tummy, it's actually still considered outside of your body. So then when you start having more gut permeability and then undigested food particles get into the bloodstream, now there's a greater chance of more inflammation in the body. Go ahead, Evan. Yeah, so we should probably mention histamine as part of this. Now, we've yes. done a whole show. We did a whole podcast on this, which I think was really good, all about histamine intolerance. But I just want to briefly mention that part of this whole cascade of problems that you're talking us through, histamine could be a variable or a factor. So if you've got this eczema rosacea piece, that could be worsened if you have a histamine intolerance, which 
histamine intolerance, once again, kind of like the dermatitis issue that you discussed, that is a byproduct of something. Histamine intolerance doesn't just exist in a vacuum. It's happening because of something. So you've got to work backwards and figure out why are you having this reaction in the first place? It's not just go on a low histamine diet. That may be part of the solution, but why do you have to do that? Exactly. I'm going to go pull up here just a couple of pictures so y'all can see. And again, if you're using Google image to, let's say, kind of follow some of these skin reactions, just make sure you type in like mild or whatever, because Google image tends to show you the most pathological extreme version of most of these conditions. FYI. Um, so you can see here is just some uticaria or some hives. You can see kind of these raised little circles here. These are your typical hives. So you can see that. And then, of course, um, your tinea, tinea versicolor. I'll just type in mild so we don't get the, the crazy extremes. So typically, you see almost a little bit of hypopigmentation happen. So if this is your skin that's actually lightening up, that's tinea. It, it's, it looks very similar almost to vitiligo. So vitiligo is an autoimmune condition. That's what Michael Jackson had that destroys the pigment. So vitiligo, mild. Let's go look at that real quick. That basically destroys the melanin in the skin. That's autoimmune. But if you look at vitiligo, that's actually um, very similar. So you could see kind of some of that hypopigmentation, right? It's a lot more common, man. I used yep. to never see anybody with vitiligo. Now, yep. almost every time I go out in public, I see somebody with vitiligo. That just tells you the world's become more toxic. There's more compromised gut barriers. Yeah, and then you can see here, you know, various tinea here where it kind of is a little bit of hypopigmentation. That's pityriasis versus a color similar. Again, we're just kind of going over the common things. We have the various infectious rashes. Uh, and then, of course, we have eczema and dermatitis, which are going to be eczema versus, I should say, psoriasis, which are similar autoimmunity. So you can see typically, um, here we go right here. So you can see psoriasis is a little bit more raised and flaky. Yeah. Eczema is a little bit more flat to the skin, but they, they look very, very similar. You need a good dermatologist to kind of help diagnose that. But the nice thing is, because it's autoimmune, you know, we're going to be doing similar, similar things to fix it. There's a good versus right there. Uh, right there. What's it say? Go look right there. There's like a little. That one? Yeah, that one. I'll do that next. So you can see psoriasis a little bit more flaky and white. Eczema a little bit more red. Here's our friend Dr. Jockers popping up in Google Images. Good doc, Good job, Dr. Jockers. Oh, right here? Yeah, Where that's he his at? image. That, that red one that you're on right now. That says oh, this Dr. one here. Jockers. Oh, yeah, good. Oh, yeah, yeah. Great. Yeah, Dr. Yeah, good. Awesome. Chronic lifelong, common adults, autoimmune. Yeah, thick silvery scale so it's really the, the silveriness and then the, the eczema is a little bit more red all right yeah, and then so they, food they reactions really... can cause that as well i know with with your wife as well as mine eggs were a big reaction for my kiddos down the breast milk side so yeah. keeping that in mind is really helpful sometimes autoimmune even when a mom's breastfeeding can make a big difference and was there any other skin issues you wanted to look at while we're here mm, i think those are the most common we encounter uh, i'll say one more thing acanthosis nigricans is interesting um, cause a lot of skin stuff that we'll talk about in a minute, <clears throat> I'll just do mild. So we don't get the crazy stuff is you'll see it a lot of times you'll see it. It's very common in African American women. Um, but yep. and I think it's because they're just more sensitive carbohydrate wise. There's a lot more like insulin resistance issues in the African American community, but obviously it's everywhere now, but you'll see it a lot. It's just like a pigmentation issue around the back of the neck or like you'll see it in the armpit area um right in here yeah here that's okay, from hyperinsulin that's okay. from hyperinsulin so too much carbohydrates you're going to see a lot of that and why is that important because if you're consuming too much insulin insulin is actually going to drive up your body's um sebaceous glands and it's going to cause you to make more sebum and that sebum is actually going to have impacts on your oil in your skin and then that oil is going to feed the bacteria and that bacteria can cause cyst and acne and skin issues. So it's really important when we look at foods, we keep one, the insulin levels down, or at least within what you need. Okay. If you're more insulin resistant, that means you have to keep the carbohydrates lower, more vegetables, less fruit and starch. Okay. The next one is looking at the inflammation component of the food, keeping the inflammation down. Could that be being autoimmune? Yeah. If you have autoimmune genetics and you're seeing skin issues popping up that have an autoimmune 
connection, like the ones we just talked about, yes, some people paleo is enough because paleo, which is cutting out just grains, legumes, and dairy, maybe allow some butter. It's focusing on whole foods, meats, vegetables, maybe some fruits, maybe some safe starches, some good fats, except the, the junky refined processed omega-6s. That's usually enough for most people, but some have to go to that paleo template 2.0, that autoimmune template to get that next inflammation buffer. Yeah, or like nightshades for were an issue for me for a while, surprisingly with my skin, because I would do some of these uh, salsas, you know, just combos of like jalapeno peppers and tomatoes and all that. And I would have mild rashes that would pop up on my face when I had gut infections, I couldn't do salsa for quite a while. So I was also probably eating it with organic blue corn chips at the time. So it could have been corn as well. Could have been corn. That's why you got some better brands out now. The Siete brand ha- makes a good yuca or cassava based flour, which are the same things. And that can be excellent because it's a safe tuber and it's, it's going to be grain free. So you have options like that. So we always start with the diet. Number one, um, we may do the autoimmune 2.0 next. We also have to look at the gut because gut permeability through either inflammation in the food, poor digestion, or dysbiotic bacteria, H. pylori, various parasites, all those things can make a big difference knocking those down. And depending on what comes back, we're going to create a protocol to address those different things. So of course, we're not going to go into each thing because we have other podcasts that deal with that. So feel free and take a look at any of our gut bug or SIBO or parasite podcasts for more info. We'll try to put maybe some links in the references, but keep that in the back of your head. Any, any thoughts on that, Evan? Yeah, well, think about when you and I first became friends uh, about five years ago, my skin was a mess and I had gut bugs. So I, yeah, like you said, we're not, we don't have to go super into detail, but my diet was good. I was paleo for three, four years. My skin was still messed up and it was because of my gut bugs. It had you had three different do. infections in your gut that were big. Yep. Yep. You had three different big infections. Next thing I wanted to highlight on top of that was, oh, you mentioned histamine. Now, histamine, the eutocaria stuff, the more inflammation in your gut, remember 80% of your immune systems in your gut, it's in your gallt and your malt, gastric associated lymphoid tissue in the, in the stomach, and then mucosal associated lymphoid tissue in the small intestine. The more those immune cells are, are revved up, it's going to be the basophils. The basophils, when they go outside of your, I think outside of, when they go outside of your blood into the tissue, they create they turn into mast cells essentially. And those mast cells produce histamine. So the more your immune system is aggravated and revved up, the more those basophils will move into and migrate over to mast cells and produce histamine. So think of histamine as a natural byproduct of inflammation. Makes sense. Yeah. And if you're histamine vasodilates, it opens things up. Think about it, right? If you bump your eye or bump your head, what happens? Things swell. And why is that happening? It's happening because the swelling vasodilates. It allows the immune cells to aggravate and calm down the inflammation. The problem is if it's not an acute response, meaning I bump my elbow, it's isolated. If it starts to become a systemic issue, well, now you have systemic histamine issues. And now that may manifest as eutocaria hives on your skin. It can manifest as uh, tinnitus, headaches, right? My, you know, migraines, dizziness, those kind of typical hive kind of symptoms. And so you really have to get everything under control and maybe even look at cutting out histamine on top of everything else. But we don't go there unless we've already done everything else and, and the clinical presentation leads us in that direction. Yeah, like you mentioned, a lot of times we don't have to go there because we're addressing root causes. And so mold is a big trigger too. I learned that firsthand with histamine. I was having tons of mast cell slash histamine reactions, just weird things, weird symptoms I'd never had before. Now that I've started to detox mold, I'm having less and less what I would consider histamine reactions. And I'm also doing some herbal antihistamines that I continue on a regular basis that really, really help calm things down. So I'm glad you made the distinction between histamine is a good thing, but when it becomes systemic histamine, that's not a good thing. Yeah, typically anything acute is okay because it's designed for a reason. It's the chronic out of control reactions we want to really kind of attenuate and calm down because those are the things that are going to be driven by you know, diet and lifestyle and chronic stressors. So the chronic stressors, we want to make sure they're on our radar so we can neutralize them. Yep. And testing is key. So if you've been Mm -hmm. to your, as you mentioned in the beginning, 
just like my wife, we took her to a dermatologist and they said, oh yeah, you know, this is this or this is that just a generic, you know, fancy term and didn't have any root cause measures. Didn't talk about changing personal care products. Didn't talk about the diet. Didn't talk about food allergens. None of it. It was just, yep, your skin is sucks. Here's some steroids topically. Uh, same thing with the gut. So if you go to a gut doctor and they say you have gastritis, you're no closer to the answer than you were when you walked in. Exactly. Yeah, it's hilarious. People go in, they, they just get the the Latin terminology, like, okay, like I go to the orthopod, my knee's hurting. Uh, you have arthritis in your knee. Well, of course, that's just joint inflammation of the knee, right? The root cause is not talked about. So regarding skin stuff, especially with people that have it, the diet's going to be the first thing to look at. And you have to really be 100% on the diet to see how much improvement you're going to get. Now, there is more nuanced stuff. Sometimes you're going to have issues where eggs or nightshades or nuts could be a problem. And that's where if you're not getting the benefit on paleo 1.0 or just a, a regular paleo template, this is where an autoimmune template would be utilized next. So first level was paleo. Second level was autoimmune. So yeah, because of the chocolate too. The chocolate's kind of in that same category with chocolate or coffee nuts. or coffee too with the histamine. Most don't have to go to that level to get the benefit. So people that are listening, you don't have to do autoimmune first. If you know you have an autoimmune issue already diagnosed, then jump on the autoimmune as a shortcut. Yep. Number two, make sure you're digesting and breaking down your food and you're chewing your food up good enough. Make sure you're chewing your food up. You're not hydrating with food, with meals. I mean, you can have a couple ounces of water to swallow some pills. That's fine, but you should not be hydrating and trying to actually consume water during those meals to hydrate. Do that 10 minutes or so before, two hours after. And then make sure you really dial in your enzymes and acids so we can better break down those foods. A lot of people and a lot of gut bacterial issues, they create stress in the gut. That stress and inflammation in the gut activates the sympathetic nervous system response, which will decrease your own internal enzyme, acid, and gastric secretions because of the internal stressors. You could be on a beach totally in a zen-like state, but your microbes may be stressed. Yeah, let's talk about the environment of when and where you're eating. If you're driving a car trying to eat a Chipotle burrito, that's a terrible idea. If you're in for me, and I think other people experience the negative effects, but maybe they're just not cognizant of how it's affecting them. Noisy restaurants. If you go out to a nice steakhouse, but they got freaking a million people in there and they got music cranked up so loud, you have to yell to talk to the person across the table from you. That's a sympathetic stressor. I don't care how nice the steak is. You're probably not going to digest it optimally. Think of our ancestors when they were eating a zebra, they're sitting on the edge of a cliff and you don't hear freaking anything except the birds. So it's just not natural to be in a closed building with so much noise where your body is like alert, alert, alert. Because yeah. You're turning off enzymes and turning yeah. on cortisol. And there, there are things you could do. I mean, you could put you could put on some meditation music or some some binaural beats, something like that. You could work on your breathing, and you could kind of like kind of control everything coming at you input wise. That would help. You could focus on gratitude. All these things activate the sympathetics. Deep breaths in, all breathing through the nose to activate the parasympathetics. But yeah, 100% control the environment. Number two, you don't have that much control over the environment. Then you do extra things regarding you know, the music, uh, what you're focusing on, uh, the breathing. The breathing is the biggest thing. Anytime you get into a stressful situation, program your body to just breathe deep and breathe through the nose. Because the first thing that happens when stress occurs is shallow breathing coming from the mouth and chest. So if you know that and you can just control the breathing and make it come through the nose and keep the belly moving and, and still do those four to five seconds in and out, then you're going to be set. You're going to have a big control on your sympathetic nervous system. That's good advice. Yeah, I think I forget that sometimes, you know, I hear like the super loud environment. I'm like, Oh, God, it's so loud in here. And I probably jump into sympathetic, I could probably try to yeah. counteract it better. But I'd still rather sit in the middle of the woods and eat a sandwich, you know? 100%, 100%. First thing that happens is anyone listening, just focus on the breath, breathing in through the nose. And then you can go out to the nose too or out to the mouth, that's fine. The most important thing is into the nose. That's the most important thing, you know, about four seconds in, hold for a second, four seconds out, hold for a second. That's perfect, that's great. Now, enzymes, acids, controlling the environment, parasympathetic versus sympathetic nervous system response, right? Parasympathetics are the break and the, the relaxation. Sympathetics are the gas, the acceleration, the go, 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 go. 
So we got to make sure that's under control. Got to be 100% on the diet. Start on paleo 1.0, go to autoimmune 2.0. And then I would say, look at what's going on with the gut. As you address that, make sure we have detox support in place if we are having reactions. Detox support could be just adding the herbs in very slowly so we don't kill things off too fast. The more debris we kill off, it's like it's the equivalent of putting a, imagine your detoxification or your immune or your lymphatic system is really poor, not doing well. That's like me taking my coffee cup and like saying, hey, this is your trash can. Like put your trash from your house in this. This is your trash can. So we know if you do that, this is going to be overflowing before the morning's over, right? So that overflowing is going to be symptoms, skin issues, headaches, joint pain, all of those things. So number one is we can take the cup up and change, you know, take the garbage out a lot of times to make sure it doesn't overflow. And we would do that through lymphatic support. We would do that through titrating the herbs and very slowly. We would do that in through binding support. We may do that through sulfur amino acids and or glutathione or, or extra antioxidants to support phase one or extra sulfur aminos for phase two. It would depend on each patient. So we can taper it up so we don't put too much garbage in. Number two, we can support the lymph, which essentially allows things to move better and then support the detoxification. And as that gets better and we support those systems, it's like we're kind of bringing in a new garbage pail instead of the cup. Now we have the bigger mug and then we have the small garbage pail and then the bigger one. And so we kind of upgrade each time as we titrate things up and support the lymph, support the detox, support the binding support and the elimination. Yeah. And it's always a little bit of a seesaw, right? Like when you say it like that, it sounds so easy. It's like take lymph, take lymph support herbs, take liver support herbs, take glutathione, and you'll be in good shape. But the truth is when we're working with people, it's highly individualized because depending on how long you've been sick, depending on how many layers you have to your illness or your symptoms, you may not be able to handle it. For example, if I do too much glutathione, I feel bad, but if I do none, I feel bad. So I, I think of it like a, like a, a tightrope is kind of my analogy. So it's like if you do nothing, you fall off the tightrope to the left and you're symptomatic. If you have it dialed in perfectly for you, you're walking the tightrope to the finish line. But if you do too much, you fall off the other side. And so like as people get better, when we're doing follow-up calls, we may be tweaking the dose. Whereas before they could only handle two capsules of a liver support complex with milk thistle and beet powder and artichoke and all that but now they can handle four capsules. And so uh, it, it's not where we want you to just like go to Whole Foods, buy a liver supplement and expect it to make all your problems go away with your skin. You've really got to have a coordinated plan. And as you get better or as you get worse or new stressors come in, you've got to back the dosing down. So like for me, when I was going through gut work, if I was really stressed, I couldn't handle the full dose of antiparasitic herbs. I had to cut it in half. And then when I was less stressed, like you and I talk about this idea of like do things on a weekend when you're not as stressed, mm -hmm. try new mm -hmm. supplements. It's the same concept with this of the, of the detox pathways. 100%. So it's push and catch, right? Push meaning we're stressing, potentially stressing out our detox system through various killing. And then catching is we're eliminating, we're supporting our lymph our detox, our phase one, our phase two, to making sure we're actually having regular bowel movements. We're making sure all these things are happening so we can eliminate things. And when we talk about binders, binders aren't perfect. Imagine you have a whole bunch of iron filings on the table and I just take a magnet and I just kind of pull it through. Will the magnet grab every single iron filing there? No, there's gonna be some stragglers, right? But it's gonna grab a good chunk. So think of that as like charcoal or bentonite clay or activated charcoal or zeolite or citrus pectins or chlorella, whatever binder we use for whatever that iron filing is, there's gonna be some debris left behind. That's why we wanna you know, do multiple doses a day and we wanna taper up so we're not overwhelming our system with too many iron filings, so to speak. The iron yeah. filings be, being reminiscent of the debris that's left behind. Yeah, so just to say it another way, you can make yourself worse by doing too much binders, right? It sounds really sexy. Let's bind to the toxin. I'm just going to take tons of charcoal. Mm, I made myself worse. I was doing like six caps of charcoal. You could a pull day. more things out. You could pull more things out. That's why we taper into everything.
Yeah, I did like six capsules of charcoal for a while and I felt amazing. I was like a new man. And then I went up more like eight or 10 capsules a day and it was too much. I got super Yeah, I remember dizzy. you called me that night. I remember you're like, man, I'm feeling really dizzy. And I think that might've been foggy. the day I did a uh, double dose glutathione. That was glutathione. You're right. Glut yeah, I think I charcoal, talked to you about maybe doing more charcoal to counteract it. Yeah, I remember yeah, but that. Charcoal, same thing though. Uh, I, like in, in that situation, charcoal was the remedy, but before charcoal was the was the the provocation if you will it was the bad guy because i did too Correct. much and my analogy of that one is like you have a bad girlfriend and you're kicking her out of the house and so she's like taking the pictures off the wall and throwing them down the hallway like there's this collateral damage of you kicking her out same thing with the toxin when you're dragging the toxin out especially if you have a permeable gut barrier i think of it as like these toxins reabsorbing back into the bloodstream like the goal is pull them through the intestinal tract but if the intestinal tract is compromised, you're going to have reabsorption. So I, I can't prove this 100%. But my theory and thought on this is that if your gut barrier is in better shape, we measure the secretory IgA, the gut is less leaky or not leaky. Hopefully and theoretically, binders would be more tolerated versus someone where we see a super leaky gut. Binders may make them worse. They may need to titrate very slowly. What do you 100%. think? What's your yep. thoughts on that? I think you're hundred percent right. Everything you have to ease into it. And that's why we always start with diet and hydration and digestion first, because that's where most people's stressors are coming from. And we want that foundation kind of just dialed in because if they're able to digest and break down their food better, then they're extracting the antioxidants and the B vitamins and the sulfur amino acids from their food. And if we're breaking it down, then they're getting those nutrients in. There's less stress of the food kind of fermenting and rotting behind. And then we're making sure that they're having regular bowel movements. So we're eliminating toxins. And then we're making sure we're getting enough hydration. A solution to pollution is dilution. And then if we're also more sensitive, we can lean more on detoxification from sweating. We could do infrared, near infrared sauna. We could even do just some gentle red light therapy, which can help with skin issues too. On the outside, it can really help reduce the inflammation of the active skin lesions. So these are really good ways to kind of start things out. We can progress from paleo 1.0 to autoimmune 2.0 if we need. I think that's probably one of the first good steps. Any, any feedback on the foundation steps, Evan? The part about pooping regularly you briefly mention it, but that could be literally the biggest piece of the puzzle is simply just addressing chronic constipation in someone. If they've been doing diuretics like coffee and teas and they're not getting enough water, I can't tell you how many times you and I have seen people's skin improve just by getting them to go poop two to three times a day versus they used to poop every other day or some people once a week, which is just scary. It's like, what? You're eating three times a day for seven days and only one poop comes out per week. That is terrible. No wonder you got bad skin. Oh, I know. There's a famous uh, gastroenterologist named Mechnikov. Mechnikov's quoted, his famous quote is, life and death starts in the colon. And part of that is just being able to have regular BMs and move your stools, at least 12 inches of stool a day. If not, you are going to have what's called auto intoxication, right? Auto meaning self intoxication, self poisoning from yep. not pushing the debris out of your body. That's like not taking out your garbage for a couple of weeks and the flies and maggots start to come home to, to, to rest, so to speak. And that's not good. So we have to make sure those foundational things are done. Uh, I can't underestimate water, right? The solution to pollution is dilution. Say that 10 times fast. The solution, right? The solution to pollution, to toxins is dilution. So you dilute it down, right? So more water helps make everything go round, right? That's really important. Let's talk about lymph. So I'm a big fan of making sure the lymph is supported. So there's various tinctures that we use professionally, different lines that we use. There's some individual herbs that we can do. Low hanging fruit is going to be ginger. Ginger is really, really excellent with lymph. So is red roots. And so is burdock. Those are my two or three favorite kind of lymph supports to kind of keep things moving outside of various tinctures that we use. I've got lymph support right here on my desk. So one that I didn't even know about maybe a year ago was cleavers. And so my lymph blend is, yes, red root, which is also great for the spleen. We yep. love using red root for Lyme and co-infections. Um, echinacea would also echinacea be considered. Lymph, yep. Uh, and then we've got the cleavers. And then this other one that I didn't know about uh, is baptisia, like, like you're getting a baptism, Ooh. baptisia wow. root. And so um, here's a funny story real quick. 
I think stories are helpful because like we yep. get an educating mode, story but time. then I think people like story time. Okay. So, you know, I had tested for some Bartonella antibodies and for Babesia. And so I was playing around with some of these Bartonella and Babesia herbs. And within about half an hour of doing that, I got a super bad headache. And I thought, you know what? I wonder if this is lymphatic related. Maybe I'm killing off these pathogens and my lymphatic system is overwhelmed. So what did I do? I took three shots of lymphatic blend of herbs. And guess what? The headache magically went away. I didn't do anything else. I didn't drink a ton of water. I didn't take charcoal. All I did was go from taking Babesia Bartonella killers to take an extra lymphatic support and the headache disappeared. And I was like, oh my God, this is a miracle. Like the lymphatic system is super underrated. And I think it's the missing component to a lot of people's detox protocols. Interesting. I 100% agree. By the way, the the Baptista herb is the same thing as wild indigo. Ah, In my GI clear two, which is my H pylori killer, I have wild indigo or Baptista in there. And then also my GI clear four, which is my bigger bug killer. I did formulate that with burdock root. Burdock root is very, very, very good. And then some of the female hormone herbal supports will actually have red root in it because red root is excellent for lymph. So, you know, women premenstrually, intermenstruation may get a little bit more swelling, fluid retention, red root can be helpful. And the next one that's really good is poke root. Poke root is really good, especially for mastitis. Um, poke root is excellent. I okay, love so that here's one. Some, here's well. something interesting. Um, when you start to upregulate these detox pathways and uh, you upregulate lymphatic drainage, your pee smells way different. I don't know how much you've played with lymphatic support, but when I start bumping up lymph support and liver support, the urine will just smell way different, especially red root, because I believe red root specifically is one of the herbs that helps to drain the excess ammonia. And a lot of these bacterial pathogens you and I are yep. talking about, we can measure the aromatic acid on the organic acids panel. And that'll yeah. show ammonia excess. Rabinitol or rabinitic. So when you drain this stuff out, you can smell the change. Like if your human pee smells like cat pee, to me, you know you're on the right track of draining that excess ammonia out of your system. H. pylori will also convert some of the protein metabolism into ammonia as well. And ah. ammonia is very alkaline too, so it actually will disrupt digestion. That's part of the reason why or how H. pylori makes your gut less acidic because part of their urea metabolism from urease to urea right? H. pylori makes this enzyme called ure- ure- urease. You know, it's an enzyme because of the ASC at the end. And that urease hits the urea, which is from protein metabolism and spits off CO2 and ammonia. And that ammonia has got a pH of 11. So that decreases your stomach acid levels, makes it less acidic. So digestion goes downhill and then you have higher CO2 levels. Hence the, the CO2 urea breath test will come back positive for H. pylori. So yeah, 100%. And I Typically, I'm not a big person that has a lot of die-off. My big die-off symptoms will be a little bit of fatigue and a little bit of skin stuff. But some people have significant die-off issues. And the more your health has kind of gone downhill, the more you may have die-off symptoms. You just kind of have to be aware of that. What do you say the longer you've been sick too? I think the timeline of it is Mm -hmm. a big role too. Yes, because I think it takes time to get your immune system hyper-reactive like that. It takes time. Mm Mm-hmm. Yep, absolutely. Anything else you wanted to work on addressing now before we go into some questions? Well, why don't we just mention the testing then that we would be using to investigate these issues? There's not yep. like a there's not a lymphatic test to measure your lymphatic system. You know, you can really just look at symptoms. You can look at any potential edemas. You can have people do like self lymphatic massage, and if they get better or worse from it, you know, lymph is a factor. Um, you've got swollen lymph nodes you can look at, so some of the clinical signs, but there's not like a test where you go and pee in a cup and it says your lymphatics are not working. We're primarily going to be looking at other markers to indicate the system as a whole. So like organic acids testing is always part of our workup. Um, genetic stool testing is always part of the workup. Um, blood testing can be helpful because you mentioned some of like the specialized white blood cells. We may look at those to gauge the immune system overall. Uh, but without the data, you're really just guessing and checking. So that's why I say, don't just buy a liver support, figure out what the heck's going on first. Are you recycling toxins? Like, are you, are you bringing toxins through a, a open loop where you're getting them out? Or is it a closed loop? Like beta glucuronidase issues that are too high due to bacterial overgrowth. That's a big issue, a big mechanism we fix. Yeah. So input is going to be decrease all the toxins coming in organic food, whole food, uh, making sure you're digesting your food, enough water, decreasing all, you know, 
having high quality food decreases the antibiotics, decreases pharmaceutical load in the food because animals or plants were sprayed with them if they're not organic. And then also um, enough water, right? Solution to pollution is dilution. So that's kind of our first starting point. And then we can also look at our hygiene products, right? Skin care, soaps, deodorants, make sure we're not rubbing a whole bunch of toxins on it. Um, make sure we're pooping regularly, at least 12 inches of stool, a really good solid poopy policeman number four in the Bristol a day is ideal. And then we can kind of work on pushing things out, whether it's cleaning out the guts, supporting phase one or phase two detoxification. Phase one is going to be more B vitamins and antioxidants. Phase two is going to be more uh, sulfur amino acids and glutathione. And then our various binders that we may use depending on what's happening and then various lymphatic support. And then of course, we're going to work with patients and dial that in hundred percent. And the diet's got to be really, really, really solid. Yeah. And please don't wear scented products. It destroys me, but it destroys you too. So like your laundry detergent, think about it. You're wearing those clothes all day and your skin is absorbing that. So if you're wearing, you know, Tide detergent, it's garbage. Get rid of that crap. Go free and clear. Even if you're not going with more of the quote, like organic brands, even your conventional mainstream laundry detergent brands now make free and clear. Like all is a very cheap brand. They have free and clear where it's not synthetic fragrance. Stop using dryer sheets. Use wool balls. If you have to, they last forever. That's what I have. I have the wool balls That's and your it. clothes won't be staticky. So, yep. uh, you and I were kind of chatting about it off air, the chemicals that people wear on their clothes, 99 out of a hundred people in my experience have a smell to them. So whether it's a cologne, a perfume, a dryer sheet, a laundry detergent, it's toxic stuff going into your skin. So you could just have your diet dialed in, but what are you doing every day? You're spraying your neck and your wrist with this perfume that you think other people want to smell that goes into your bloodstream. Those are toxic chemicals. I've had clients that are in the perfume industry and they can hide thousands and thousands of chemicals under that quote fragrance term. So there's actually a documentary about fragrances. I think it was called stinky, uh, but it was just about how dirty the industry is of chemicals. And none of this stuff is tested on uh, humans long-term. It's just, it might smell quote good, but you don't know what the heck it is. Absolutely. And I had a patient who had some skin issues this last week and her, a lot of her gut symptoms got a lot better and she was improving in other ways, but her skin was still lagging behind. She did a little bit of research and she found that she actually had a skin parasite. And this could be, let's say, I call it, put it in the X factor category, where if you're doing a lot of the foundational things and maybe a lot of the first level gut stuff and you're still not seeing improvement in the skin, this would be a good area to look. This is a, a parasite, it's called Demodex. And it can create inflammation in the follicle. And there are some wow. various ointments or topical things you can put on your skin to actually help some of these um, Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Is this something that you would fix from the inside out with antimicrobials? Well, or? you do it on the inside, but these things live on the follicle of the skin. So you have to topically apply things to get these things under control. There are some formulas that have some herbs in them like astragalus and such, some oriental medicine type of herbs, but it's going to be more topical. And what's and the so- conventional medical model say about this? What are they doing? You know what? I don't even know what the conventional medical model is because it's so undiagnosed. It tends to be missed. Oh, I've seen, so, yeah, tiny mite. I've seen this on people's little, eyelashes. They, they yes. can go on the eyelashes. But again, the key thing is these things tend to hit people that are going to be immunocompromised. Yeah, so go the right more, there. Go into that PubMed right there. Let's see what that, that 2014. Yeah, go yeah. to that one. Let's see what it says. This is interesting. So this is a a potential vectors. It's, I kind of put it in the X factor category. So your people are on top of it. So it's a various mite and they can live and they can create inflammation. So okay, look at it. it's a tiny parasitic mites that live near hair follicles, but Keep they can going. affect the skin as well. They say, they say like quick treatment, but it didn't say anything about treatment. Yeah. Let's, let's see what kind of, let's see what we got here for treatment. Yeah. So here you go. Another useful feature is the complex, the, the scabicide. Demo, uh, yeah. A scabicide. Lindane or Lindane. Oh, I think, I think Lindane is pretty darn toxic though. I've heard of Lindane. I don't know what I've heard of Lindane as well. And Lindane, I'm pretty sure. So you can see they got it on their skin as well. So they have it here as well. So there's little mites in here, but I'm pretty sure Lindane is pretty darn toxic. Let me just see if there's any other treatment options. Yeah. So there's, there's various methods, but I'm pretty sure Lindane is pretty darn toxic. So you got to be careful though. But in general, there are options there. 
and there are some natural ones as well. Um, oh yeah, there you go. Yeah, right there on uh, right. Go up on Wikipedia. There it is. Wind, lindane agricultural insecticide. Oof. Yeah. So you're putting an insecticide on your on your skin. Well, and it absorbs. You know, toxin. it's going to absorb. It's going to absorb body. and go through your body and go through your liver for sure. Yep. But there are some herbs that are out there that are in Oriental kind of salve type of form that you can topically apply as well. And then you think approaching antimicrobials in the gut would probably help this too. I think you should still go through everything and then potentially try a good topical thing on the, on the backsides of it. Oof, I hate to go on lending. I mean, I guess if you're miserable, you got to do what you got to do. Well, I would do the topical things first. Yeah. um, That are going to be more on the healthy side. I'll see if I can pull it up here in a minute. Um, there's some good topical ones that are out there that may be good options. I'll have I've actually, I actually had a client that brought that, it brought that to me. She said, I have a, I think she said it was scabies. I guess that was the same thing. Scabies. Similar. On her, yeah. Same family on her, uh, on her eyelashes and nobody had any answers. So I just suggested coconut oil. Cause I figured coconut oil was a sort of an antimicrobial antiviral. And I just had her rub coconut oil right here on kind of the top of the eyelid and she did get somewhat better it wasn't complete resolution from that alone though ah interesting interesting i'll pull up a couple of things here that people can do we didn't talk about coconut oil but i think that would be a good like first line of defense topical solution i mean we use that for my daughter's our first daughter's um, cradle cap because coconut is sort of an antifungal antimicrobial the carpilic acid and the monolaurin in there those are both really good really good topical but also internal so eating coconut oil could help too yes exactly and yeah the medication that this person tried and did and had good success with it was basically just a a sulfur a sulfur and zinc oxide cream interesting and and, then it worked yep exactly it worked very well so it was a sulfur kind of and um zinc oxide cream that's exactly what it was that seems easy enough yep i'll put up a couple of the the visual people can see it so they can have some good options. Was that like a prescribed thing or is this something you could just get over the counter? This was an over the counter thing. I wonder how sulfur would do that. Maybe it just kills it. Maybe the thing can't breathe in sulfur. I don't know. Yep. Sulfur has a natural antimicrobial effect. Let me go pull up my screen here. All right. So here's one for the Demodex. Can you see my screen yet? Yep, I see it. It's got some crazy it's Chinese a, letters on it. A there. zinc oxide sulfur supplement. And again, this website is Demodex. So it's demodex.co.uk. And it has a lot of good options for topical Demodex. And this was shared to me by my patient. That's amazing. And she tried okay. it. So it's good. I just want to put it out there. Yeah. It's an X factor. It's not the, It's not the, going to be the first thing you go to. Go up, go down just a hair. I like, it says something in the description. Go down just a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep, that, it's going to be zinc oxide and then sulfur. Okay, so it says here, I mean, they're talking a lot of stuff, microbial, fungal, uh, demodex. They're talking uh, it can soften epidermis. Uh, it, it, it can be in, in the treatment of acne as well, steroid-inducted rosacea. Yeah, I mean, topical zinc is going to be great. The nice thing about these things, you can do it for a lot of other things. So it'd be worth giving it a try. Here's another one as well, anti-acne and demodex cream. I mean, you could see this thing has a couple of uh, herbs in here as well. Let me try to find the ingredients. We learn so much from working with people clinically. Oh, yeah. So, so great. Stamoni roots, Monary seeds, Bristol, Chinese carnations. There's a couple of different things. And I some of these properties. parabens aren't the best, but I mean, hey, you know, this is designed to be an acute type of treatment. So hopefully that gives some people a couple of ideas here. Demodex.co.uk is a good option very cool Excellent. see this is the stuff we learn by working with people this you're not going to find this at your dermatologist office no it was great my patient was able to share that with me and we were able to to get it out there and it's not going to be the first thing that people who have skin issues should go to but yeah. if you tried a lot of things hey put it in their back pocket give it a try there, there you nice go. thing well, is we're all results driven there's no there's no dogma here right it's all about getting results Yep. Well, I think that's all we need to cover. I hit the testing. I don't know if you wanted to say anything about testing that you do. There is like patch testing and stuff like that, but you know, we're not dermatologists, so we're not running patch testing. Get the gut dialed in, um, feel free and go see a good dermatologist to just get things ruled out. If they kind of give you the, the diagnosis, the diagnoses that we've already talked about, fine. You know, that makes sense. There's going to be things like perioral that can be caused by other issues, whether rubbing too much experimental stuff on your skin or as a female, 
birth control pills can cause perioral dermatitis. That's a unique situation because more topical things like coconut oil can actually make it worse. So, you know, just keep an eye on that. It's always good to at least get a diagnosis to know what you're dealing with. And that way you can make sure the root cause is under control. I just wish dermatologists were more root cause. They aren't, but at least if you get the diagnosis though, then you can listen to this podcast and try to connect to the root cause. But if you're listening, if you're listening and you're a paleo dermatologist, please reach out to us. We would love to speak with you. Love to speak with you. Love a good referral base for these kind of things. Excellent. Any questions, Evan, you want to dive into? I don't have them pulled up. So why don't you tell me if there's any good ones? Yeah, there's a lot of things we kind of already address. I'll, I'll hit Addie's issue. I keep on having boils under my arm every time I shave. Uh, usually resolves on its own. Is there an underlying issue I should worry about? I mean, it just depends. Obviously, there's a, a follicle inflammation issue that's happening. If it's only happening with shaving, I mean, is there some kind of lubricant that you could put in, maybe use a coconut oil or a shea butter or just some kind of a natural soap lather that will provide a little bit uh, more support from the friction if it's only happening from that. So hard to say there. Sebastian writes in, Thanks for all the awesome information. Always, this is gold. I've gone through a lot of what you guys are mentioning. Awesome to know how it all unfolds and the causes. Thanks so much, Sebastian. And then Sean writes in, I've had reoccurring subdermatitis in the beard area past three years, sent in Genova dysbiosis and suspect it's candida. Yeah, so there's some really good antimicrobial shampoos that you can do topically, but you want to hit on the inside and the out. And again, I have them on my site, justinhealth.com slash shop. Click on recommended products. I have some Amazon links to some of those creams and soaps there. I would love to see you grow a beard. I've never seen you grow a beard. <laughs> uh, it's been a while, man. It's been a while. I think it's been about six years, but yeah, I, I may have to pull it out this winter. We'll see. When I, when I tried to grow a beard, I noticed I always touch my face more. And I think that could contribute to what this guy was mentioning with his skin. Anytime I got a lot of hair, I'm always touching my face and who knows what's on your skin, oils and, and mm-hmm. bacteria and other things. Yep. So uh, that's totally true. Sean writes in very clean SED based whole food diet, but I think I need to eradicate with antimicrobials. Yep. That's the next step, Sean. Ashley writes in, can candida die off, make you dizzy and weak? Yes, it can. It totally can. And do die off symptoms come and go like last couple hours, then go away and come back. Yeah. I mean, they can definitely oscillate for sure. Evan, you agree? Oh, absolutely. And if you're, you know, if you can go, you know, drink more water, as you said, dilute, and then go pee and take lymphatic support, maybe some kidney support, you have a good bowel movement, maybe that will help lessen the die off. But also when I feel bad, I'll do just a little bit of charcoal. 100%. Uh, what can cause dry, big flaky patches in the hairline? That's going to be your sub dermatitis, which tends to be more fungal based. Uh, can die off be exacerbated by passing hard and dry stools? I see people that do pass stools, either they have an issue, meaning a, a intensi- intensification, or they actually feel better. So it can definitely, the passing of things can definitely shift what's happening in your gut as well. Um, Dennis Rice says, antiperspirants bad for your health. Yeah, they are. Basically, it's an aluminum molecule that's dehydrated that, that then expands and clogs the pore and makes it impossible for you to sweat, at least while it's there. So definitely not good. You rather have something that allows you to sweat, but has natural antimicrobial qualities that kills the bacteria that produces the not so nice smell. You know, you can do that with shea butter or coconut oil or very, very much, uh, very certain parts of the coconut oil, like caprylic acid tends to be more antimicrobial. Sean says I have high morning cortisol and very high DHEA, some sort of gut dysbiosis as well as what I'm dressing what will be the connection. Well, inflammation in the gut causes inflammation in the body and your stress handling system tries to deal with that. Aaron writes in, um, is there a, a relationship between skin disorders and chronic Lyme? Definitely can be. Lyme is a stressor on the body, and that's a stressor on the liver and the detoxification, and that can easily affect the gut as well. Anytime you have inflammation in the body, it's a major stress ball in your stress bucket, and when your stress bucket's full, systems in your body don't function optimally. And people that have Lyme can have other co-infections like Evan knows about, like Babesia or Bartonella. Yeah. Well. And, and, you know, those are all immune suppressants, right? And so when your immune system is suppressed, bacteria, viruses, fungus, those can all take the forefront and take you down. So mm-hmm. part of resolving that would have to be supporting the immune system while trying to remove the microbes or at least get the microbes back in balance. There's this debate of yep. whether you can fully kill Lyme. I don't know. Yeah, we can definitely at least knock it down so it's not as big of an issue on the immune system for sure. 
And then regarding dry, um, Barb writes in, what about dry issues with skin like warty lesions? So first thing is make sure we have enough collagen and good building blocks to have healthy skin, right? Collagen amino acids are great. And then if we're having like kind of skin tag type of things, one, make sure the insulin's under control because more insulin will cause those skin tags. And then number two, you can always get like a little cotton ball and sop it up with apple cider vinegar. And then like, like kind of like get a bandaid or like a wrap and wrap it up against that lesion. And a lot of times it will fall off. You can also make like an apple cider vinegar, uh, turmeric type of um, like poultice and then put it on a bandaid or any cotton swab and then tape it to your skin that can help those lesions just kind of fall away. Maybe a little bit of tea tree mixed in with that would be good. Yeah, too. A little bit of melaleuca or tea tree. Yep. That's great too. Thoughts on CBD for detox? I mean, it's not going to be what I would use for detoxification, but it has other good immune benefits, um, mood benefits, anti-inflammatory benefits, but it wouldn't be my first thought for detoxification. CBD is like the new raspberry ketone. Remember like five years yeah. ago, there was raspberry, raspberry ketones, ketones everywhere? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Or the the green coffee extract, right? That was yep. another big one. Things get really trendy, right? Sean writes in, do you treat patients outside of Texas via phone and email? Yes, I do. Evan does as well. So to see Evan, evanbrand.com. We see patients all over the world. And for myself, justinhealth.com. See patients in Texas and all over the world. You are welcome, Sean. Evan, anything else you want to add today? I think that's it. We can wrap it up. I think just a little thing. We always put it out there every time. If you guys are enjoying this podcast, give me a thumbs up. Would like to know in the comments things that you guys have done that have been successful. I read those comments and I take that information and I incorporate it into my kind of mental tool bank, so to speak, and apply it as as necessary. So let me know your comments of what's helped you, what's made you feel better. And if you enjoy it, share it with one person that you know in your life that could benefit. 99.9% of people we help, we do it without even seeing them. And that's the power of the internet. So we appreciate you guys um, spreading the good word. Yep. Take good care. We'll see you all next week. Have a phenomenal week, y'all. Take care. Bye now. Bye-bye. Bye.